Ian Richardson in a stereo production of The House on the Strand. The novel by Daphne du Maurier, adapted for radio by Philip Lever and Kay Patrick. I remember, what's his name, old Professor Marsh, oh. accusing me of leading you into God knows what trouble. <laughs> uh, another brandy, Richard. Well, uh, I ought to be going. Vita's calling me in the early hours from New York, and it is a bit late. Oh, go on, I haven't seen you for months. Vita surely can't begrudge us this one dinner together. No, no, of course not. Well, just one more brandy then, and then I really must go. You've changed, you know, Richard. You're not the same carefree Richard Young I knew at Cambridge. No, it is 20 years ago, and you're hardly the same carefree Magnus Lake. Well, well, probably you're right. Thank you. <laughs> so, what is it to be, England or America? Have you decided yet? Well, that's the trouble, you see. I haven't decided yet. Vita's keen for me to take this directorship in New York. A brother's publishing firm. Mm. Sounds a little incestuous. <laughs> <laughs> So, Vita's pushing you to go to New York, and you'd prefer to stay in London. Vita retires to America in a half, ostensibly to collect her son from school, leaving you with a decision to make. Oh, now that's putting it a little baldly. But to the point. And you see, I think I may be able to help. Mm -hmm. You're in between jobs, right? Mm. Vita returns in a week with your stepson in tow, and then what? Well... Europe for a holiday, I suppose. After I've told Vita my decision, see England or New York. Do you remember Kilmar? My parents' old house? Yes. You used to like staying there? Yes, of course I remember it. It's a beautiful old house. Well, it's been standing empty since they died. Oh, the occasional visit from me, but that's all. I've modernised it. And a woman comes in from the village to keep everything in order. Now, what I'm suggesting, Richard, is that instead of hanging about in London waiting for Vita, you stay at Kilmar. Vita and Teddy can join you there, and well, you can all stay as long as you like. <sighs> it's tempting, Magnus. Only, well, you see, Vita's rather set her heart on the Mediterranean. I would have thought it was just what you both needed. Somewhere you can laze about in the sun. Uh, good for the boy, too. Plenty of sailing. But most important of all, the peace you need, Richard, to come to a decision. After all, it'll be a big move. Oh, surely <laughs> even Vita can see that. Well, yes, of course, of course she can. Good. Uh, so then you'll uh, put it to her, will you? Um, see what she says. Well, of course I will. It's extremely kind of you, Magnus. Oh, nonsense, dear boy. Uh, come back for lunch tomorrow, and we'll finalise arrangements. Right. Uh, another brandy to celebrate. Uh, well. Um... <laughs> Hello, Richard Young here. One moment, please. Go ahead, New York. You'll call it through. Hello? H hello? Richard? Hello! Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Are you all right? You sound a little strange. I'm oh, sorry, darling. I haven't been in long. Living it up while my back's turned, huh? <laughs> no, hardly. Just dinner with Magnus. You remember you've heard me talk about Kilmarth, Magnus's house in Cornwall, where we used to spend our holidays sometimes? Uh-huh, I remember. Well, he's, he's offered it to us, you, me and Teddy, for the summer. It's a beautiful old place. You'll love it. Cornwall? But we said Europe for summer. Yes, but... I told Bill and Diana we might see them in need. Oh, I've almost committed us, darling. You see, the thing is, I'd like to stay there. It's peaceful and it's quiet. And cold. And what about food? Oh, now, Vita, and listen... Vita, Vita, listen, Vita. It isn't primitive. Now, you just listen to me. I'll tell you about it. All right. Go ahead. Convince me. Good. I'm glad she's keen. And as I say, her major fear seems to have been that she might find it primitive. Three years of marriage in the dishwasher means more to your conjugal life than the double bed I'm throwing in for good measure. I warned you it wouldn't last. The uh, marriage, I mean, not the bed. <laughs> Oh, uh, just a second. I'll, um, I'll turn that off. Your taste in music seems to have changed, Magnus. I don't recall you having much time for the romantics before. Uh, no, no. Science has provided all the romance I need. As a matter of fact, Richard, I've stumbled across something rather exciting. I thought I sensed something simmering underneath that calm exterior of yours. 
What is it? I've had what I think is a success with one particular piece of research. A combination of plant and chemical into a drug, which has an extraordinary effect on the brain. I thought all so-called hard drugs had that kind of effect. Well, the people who take them, mescaline or LSD or whatever, pass into a world of fantasy, don't they? Filled with uh, exotic blooms and imagine they're in paradise. No, this was no fantasy world. You mean you've tried it yourself? Of course. And I repeat, this was no fantasy world I entered. It was very real indeed. What sort of world? The past. <sighs> All your sins, do you mean? The evil deeds of your misspent youth? No, 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 nothing personal at all. I was merely an observer, like a spectator at a play. I didn't take part. Well, the fact is that... No, I won't tell you what I saw. It would spoil the experiment for you. I'm sorry, I don't understand. I want you to try the drug yourself and oh. see if it produces the same oh. effect. Oh, 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 no, no, no. We're not at Cambridge anymore. Twenty years ago, I might have swallowed one of your concoctions and risked death, but not any longer. I'm not no. asking you to risk death. I'm asking you to give up twenty minutes, possibly an hour, of an idle afternoon before Vita and her son arrive by trying an experiment on yourself that may change the whole conception of time. As we know it at present. Why me? Why not try it on your disciples in London University under proper conditions? Because it would be premature. And because I'm not prepared to risk telling anyone, not even my disciples, as you choose to call them. I intend to work on it in September when I come down to Kilmarth. I've converted the old laundry into a laboratory. Now, meanwhile, you're going to be alone in the house. You could at least try it once and report back. I need your help, Richard. You're the only one I can trust, the only one who'll understand. You must understand just how much this means to me. Will you do it, Richard? Will you help me? Oh, Vita's right. I never did learn how to say no to you, Magnus. Thank you. Now... Here is the key to the lab. It's in the basement. You remember the, uh, the old laundry? Yes, I remember. Now listen carefully, this is very important. By the old sink is a cupboard. Okay. Inside you'll find three small bottles labelled A, B and C. You drink three of the measures out of bottle A. Have you got it? Bottle A. Three measures. Now, it could have a sudden effect, you know, no intervening stage, direct transition from one state to another. But no matter what you feel like, stay in the house, because you won't be aware of your body coming into contact with inanimate objects. There may possibly be a feeling of nausea, but nothing dangerous. But whatever you do, don't touch alcohol for at least three hours after taking the drug, and then go slow. Well, I'm beginning to regret this already. Now, another thing. If you should meet a figure from the past... A figure? Yes, 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 I know this sounds ridiculous, but you'll see. If you should do so, for heaven's sake, don't touch him. Inanimate objects don't matter, but if you try to make contact with living flesh, the link breaks and you'll come to with a very unpleasant jerk. I tried it and I know. Tell me, Magnus, what will I see? I prefer not to tell you. It might predispose you unconsciously to see what I saw. Now, I suggest you set off this afternoon. Give yourself this evening to settle in and take the drug sometime tomorrow morning. Give me a ring and tell me what happens. Well, that's if I'm capable. Of course you'll be capable. Oh, don't look so worried, Richard. I promise you there's absolutely no danger. No danger at all. Had enough breakfast, Mr. Young? Hey, Mr. Young? Mm-hmm. You had enough breakfast? Oh, plenty, thank you. I'm so sorry, Mrs. Collins. I was miles away. Oh. Uh, look, do you mind if I go now, Mr. Young? No, no, no. I've got to get my shopping, you see. Now, you're sure you'll be all right? Yes, yes. I'll pop back this evening and get you a meal. Yes, well, there's plenty to do. I'll be quite busy. Ah, like the professor. He manages to keep himself busy when he comes down here, though. What doing? I don't know. <laughs> let, me, let me see you out. You don't want to lock yourself away like he does. You want to get out, enjoy the fresh air. It'll do you good to walk over the hill to the sea. Yeah, bring some colour to your face. I'll probably do that later, Mrs. Collins. I've got one or two things to see to first. Well, you know your own business best, I suppose. Well, tell
Tell us in then, Mr. Young. <laughs> Goodbye, and, and thank you again. Goodbye. Oh, well, no point in putting off the evil moment. Sink, I think he said. Here we are. B. C. Ah, A. Now then, three measures. One, two, three. Well, Magnus, your health. Too, I hope. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. No nausea, numbness, nothing. <laughs> I feel cheated. Oof. Well, no point in staying here, I suppose. Might as well take Mrs. Connor's advice. <sighs> That's better. The beach, I think. What the? Where the hell are you? What is this? Greetings, Father Pryor. Who, who are you? I rode over to see you. Are you well? I need rest, Roger. That is why you find me in bed. All the rest possible. To be in a fit state to receive the bishop. You've heard the news. Oh, well, there are always rumours. This was not a rumour. The bishop has already set out from Exeter and will be here on Monday expecting hospitality and shelter for the night. Ah, his grace times his visit well. Martin Mass and fresh meat for his dinner. He'll sleep with his belly full. You've no cause to worry. But, but, but no cause to worry? You think I can control this unruly mob? What kind of impression will the monks make upon the... The new broom of a bishop primed as he is to sweep the diocese clean. They'll come to heel if you promise them reward for seemly behaviour. Keep in the good graces of Sir John Carmino, that's all that matters. Sir John is not easily fooled, and he has his own way to make with a foot in every camp. Our patron he may be, but he won't stand by me if it doesn't suit his ends. Sir Henry, as Lord of the Manor, will take precedence over Sir John on this occasion. <laughs> He'll not disgrace you, garbed as he is like a penitent. I warrant he's on his knees in the chapel now. As Sir Henry Stewart, you should show more respect for him. Henry de Champenon is a more faithful man of God than I. The spirit is willing, Father Prior, but the flesh? <laughs> Best not to talk about the flesh before the bishop's visit. No, the reason I rode over was to tell you that the French ship is lying off Kilmarth. She'll be there for two more tides if you want to give me letters for her. Uh, oh! Why, in the name of blessed Antony, did you not say so at once? Oh! I... I can find nothing in this jumble. Why are my papers never in order? Why is Brother Jean never here when I require him? A votre service, Father Prior? Hmm. Such promptness could be suspicious to a less trusting man than myself, uh, Brother Jean. Pardon? Oh, never mind. My letters. I can't find my letters. Uh, are these the ones you mean? Huh? Yes. Well, don't dally, man. Give them to Roger. Uh, monsieur. Thank you. Good night, Jean. Father Prior. Lose no sleep over the bishop's visit. Mm. Good night. Hey, hey, be careful. Look up, man. Can't you see? <laughs> Richard, 
Yes. At last. I've been sitting here waiting for you to ring. I got impatient. Well, what happened? Did it work? Yes. Are you all right? Well, I think so, except that I feel bloody tired, and I've cut my hand putting it through one of the kitchen windows. You must have touched someone. Well, he was walking straight at me. I put my hand up to protect myself, so I suppose I must have done. Apart from that, I was nearly sick in the boiler room. Oh, minor matters, dear boy, minor matters. So, it worked for you, too. Yes. How oh, absolutely splendid. Now, tell me everything from the beginning. What happened? Nothing at first. I went out and took a walk through the field to the sea. You damn fool, I told you to stay in the house. Yes, I know. For the first experiment. I, I know, but frankly, I wasn't expecting it to work. I planned to sit down and, if it did, drift off into some delightful dream. It doesn't happen like that. Well, I, I know that now. I, I suddenly heard hoofbeats. And there was this rider at my shoulder. He seemed to look at me as if daring me to follow him. He was dressed in... Well, I don't know how to describe it. Well, his clothes were probably 13th or 14th century. I haven't pinpointed the period in time yet. Well, go on. Well, I've, I've followed him to a priory. I think there's a tie up there with a medieval priory that was once part of Ty Wardreff. Uh, the father prior called my horseman Roger. Roger. I saw him too. And in both our cases, the compulsion to follow him was particularly urgent. I felt it, and so did you. I've made the trip, to use student phraseology, several times, and he's invariably been there. You'll find the same thing happens on your next trip. Oh, now, now look, Magnus, I, I did this for you today because I was on my own, and it's quite out of the question to go on. When my wife and stepson arrive, I'll be tied up with them. But you've got nearly a week, Richard. No, Magnus, I'm, I'm not trying it again. Well, of course it can still be dismissed by the sceptical. Oh, I doubt that anyone could dismiss it, Magnus. The effect of the drug is amazing. I'm almost sorry I can't get involved. I'm curious to know if I'd see Roger again. It could still be dismissed, however, Richard. You took the drug in the lab, so did I. I was thinking about you, wondering if you were seeing what I saw. Do you remember those experiments we did as students at Cambridge? Well, it wasn't telepathy, if that's what you're driving at. Of that, I'm certain. Can you prove it? Well, I'm sure I can. There must be some way. There is. Drive out to some spot in the middle of nowhere, take the drug without telling me where or when, and we'll see if we can't smash any possible theories about telepathy. <sighs> All right, Magnus, you win. Right, over there, I think, near the church. This is as good a spot as any, I reckon. I hope you appreciate this, Magnus. My word, Brother Jean, the Lady Joanna de Champanar will not wear paint on her face to meet His Grace the Bishop. No, but painted or plain, Sir John Carmino will have her. Ah, ah, here comes His Grace. No matter what troubles arise between His Majesty and Lancaster, he will ride the storm. It is an art. <laughs> It surprises me to see Otto Bodrogan here. Not two years since he fought for Lancaster against the king. Bodrogan is here today because his sister Joanna is Sir Henry's lady. Excuse me, my master is to be presented. I may be needed. And uh, may I present Sir Henry de Champenown, Lord of the Manor of Tywoodreth. Your Grace and my wife Joanna. And now, Your Grace, our loved and respected patron, Sir John Carmino of Bacchanard, without whom we in this priory would have found ourselves hard-pressed for money in these troublous times. Your Grace, we are deeply honoured to have you here amongst us. Your Grace, my brother, Sir Oliver Carmino, one of His Majesty's commissioners, and his lady, Isolde. Isolde... Is the one I'd pick if fortune favoured me. What? Oh. Yes, Brother Jean. And how long, I wonder, would she stay content within the walls of Carmino and keep a guard upon her thoughts from 
you strain. I tell you one thing, Roger. Otto Bodlagan has an eye to her. Roger. Lady Joanna. Sir Oliver and Lady Isolde lodge with us tonight. See if you can find them. I'm ready to leave now. My lady. And find Sir Henry, too. I don't know about Sir Henry, but the Lady Isolde is not far. Where? Over there. In the chapel doorway. In rather intimate conversation with Sir Otto Bodrucker. I'll take a wager with you, Roger, on how long she'll keep that guard on her thoughts. <laughs> Would you like the light on? What? what? Uh, wh where? Uh, I uh, saw you just now in the churchyard, looking as if you couldn't make up your mind whether to come in out of the rain. The, the rain? Well, uh, now that you have, let me show you around. I'm the vicar of St Andrews. It's a fine old church and we're very proud of it. But you must be an enthusiast hanging about the churchyard in the rain. I, uh, I, I am interested, yes. Uh, someone told me there'd been a priory here in former days. Oh, yes, that's been gone a long time. The buildings fell in after the dissolution of the monasteries in 1539. Uh, my, my, my interest goes back to before the dissolution of the monasteries. Oh, I understand. I've often wondered myself what it all looked like in former times. The priory was close by, you know. It was a French house attached to the Benedictine Abbey of St. Sergius and Bacchus in Angers. I believe most of the monks were French. Brother Jean. I beg your pardon? Uh, I, I was just wondering if you know anything about the lords of the manor in early times. Well, I might be able to help there. Uh, parochial history, I remember, records that the manor is mentioned in Doomsday, known as Tywardre, or House on the Strand. The last heiress, Isolde, sold it to the Champernans in the 13th century. Isolde? Yes, I believe so. I can't help much further, I'm afraid. Uh, tell me, are you staying in the district? <clears throat> um, at Professor Lane's house, Kumarth. Ah, yes. I don't think Professor Lane gets down very often, does he? He doesn't come to church. Um, no, no. Well, if you feel like coming either to a service or just to wander around, you'll be most welcome. Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, it has stopped raining. Well, goodbye, Mr... Young. Uh, goodbye, Mr. Young. Goodbye. Hope to see you again. Sure. You shouldn't have driven all the way to London. You must have set off at the crack of dawn. Why on earth did you just phone? Well, I felt too elated. It seemed no trouble at all to get into the car and drive up. This trip, I had no feeling of nausea or vertigo from the drug, just elation. I must have broken the speed limit several times driving up. Yes, that's one of the reasons we must test the drug. It could be addictive. Uh, sit down, Richard. Ad addictive? Yes. And it may not be just the fascination of the experience itself, but the stimulation to the part of the brain affected. If it's addictive, I suppose I ought to lay off it for a while. Oh, it's up to you. Uh, now, tell me what happened after you'd taken the drug this time. Well, first of all, I drove to the church. Uh -huh. I had the drug with me in your drinking class. And? This time, too, Roger was the first one I saw. Ah. I don't think I told you that he used to live at Kilmarth. You know, of course, that the foundations are 14th century. Incidentally, have you noticed how one gets the sense of the conversation without conscious translation from medieval French. Well, I hadn't thought about it at the time. Of course, you're right. Anyway, carry on, dear boy. Well, on my first visit, the bishop was due to arrive at the priory. On this trip, he had arrived, and they were all being presented to him. Sir Henry de Champenon, and his wife, Lady Joanna, and the Lady Isolde Carmen. <laughs> you seem to have met the flower of the country, which is more than I've ever done in that time or this. With me, it was the monk's dormitory. So, the point is, none of this can be put down to telepathic communication. Agreed? Agreed. Well, now, let's just think about this. Mm. The link for both of us was Roger. He is the brain that channels the information to us. Tell me, did you choose the old laundry for your experiment because the 14th century foundations were as close as you would get to Roger? 
Now, oh, don't different. run away with the idea that this experiment is some sort of ghost hunt, dear boy. No. Well, We're well. not conjuring up spirits from the vasty deep. No, of course not. To reduce it to its lowest level, if you sit in an armchair watching some old movie on television, the characters don't pop out of the screen to haunt you, although many of the actors are dead. And yet somehow one gets the feeling of taking part, not merely witnessing. I intend to do more research into the commoners and champenons when I get back to Comarts. One of my students has a buddy who works in the public records office and the British Museum. He's trying to trace one or two things for me. Uh, I haven't told him why I'm interested. The lay subsidy roll of 1327 may help, apparently. Oh, and uh, while I think of it, dear boy, the other bottle, B, should be in the cupboard in the lab. Oh, yes, it is. With, it is, it uh, is. Well, now, pack it carefully and send it to me, would you? Well, are you going to be experimenting in London? No, not on myself, on a healthy monkey. Oh, now, no, any no, no. news of Vita? Can you delay her? I mean, tell her the drains have gone wrong or something. Well, say something that'll, that'll daunt her. Nothing daunts Vita. Oh. She'll bring a plumbing expert down with her from the American Embassy or something. Oh, well, then we must just work fast. There's a great deal to do. Now, lunch first, I think. And then, if you you're to get back to Cornwall before midnight, you'd better set off immediately after. That you, Mr. Young? Yes. It's late for you, isn't it? Yeah. Something wrong, Mrs. Collins. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, but I was a bit worried about you. You see, you weren't in all day, and your bed didn't look as if it had been slept in, and there was no note, and no one had seen you in the village. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Mrs. Collins. I had to drive up to London unexpectedly, but I should have left you a note. I'm really terribly sorry. Oh, you're all right, are you, Mr. Young? You look a bit tired. No, I, I'm fine, and I do apologise. It was unforgivable to worry you like oh, that. No matter. Uh, by the way, your wife rang up earlier. From New York, it was. Mm. I had to tell her I didn't know what had happened to you, and she seemed a bit worried, and... Oh, well, I'm sorry if I did the wrong thing. Oh, no, of course not. I suppose I'd better book a call back. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Collins. Uh, hello, Richard Young here. We have that call to New York for you now, sir. Hold uh, the line, please. <clears throat> thank you. You're through now, New York. H hello, hello, Vita. Are you all right, Richard? I spoke to some woman earlier. I could hardly understand a word she said, but it was something like you'd been missing all day. I was worried. That was Mrs. Collins, the lady from the village who looks after Comas. I wasn't missing. I had to go to London for the day, and I'd forgotten to tell her. I had to see Magnus on business. Oh, so your professor's been that doesn't surprise me. What's he been making you do that's turned you into a performing seal? Oh, endless things turning out junk. I'll explain when I see you. Uh, that's why I phoned before. You'll be seeing me sooner than you expected. Oh? I'll be flying to London this evening. Bill and Diana have decided to visit London, and I'm flying with them. I'm bringing Teddy, of course. But that means you'll be here tomorrow afternoon. You needn't sound so enthusiastic. No, it's just that I'm not ready. Not ready? Look, darling, I can't explain over the phone, but, well, frankly, we're... We weren't expecting you till Monday. We? Is your professor there, too? No, no, I mean Mrs. Collins and myself, of course. She only comes in the mornings. She'd be terribly put out if everything isn't absolutely straight, and you know what you're like. You'll take a dislike to the place if it isn't shiny. Oh, what absolute nonsense. Oh, now, listen, darling, don't be obstructive. If you come down right away, it won't be convenient, and that's the plain truth of it, and I'm sorry. Okay. I'll tell Bill and Diana that it isn't convenient for my husband to see me. Oh, Vita. I'm sure they'll find that wildly amusing. Vita! Bye. Oh. Damn you, Magnus. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Morning. I think you can get past now. Sorry about the hold-up. The roads are rather narrow in this part of Cornwall, aren't they? Oh, not to worry. You did a fine job getting your caravan clear of the road. I'm used to it. I live here. Oh, Chapel Down. It's an unusual name for a house. 
We decided to keep the name of the actual plot of ground. It's been chapel down for centuries. And the fields across the road are Chapel Park. Anything to do with the old priory? Priory? Well, what priory would that be? Well, it's, uh, it's mentioned in this book, The Visitations of Cornwall. Perhaps you can tell me if there's any old farmhouse in the valley that might have been a manor house in days gone by. Well, there's uh, Trevenna up back behind us, but I've never heard that it was old. There's Trenadlin, of course, Trevarin up the valley near the railway tunnel. I believe that's, oh, hundreds of years old, about 1705, they say. Uh, my book mentions that a place called Grattan used to be an old house. Grattan? Mm. Well, if it was, there's nothing but slate and rubble now. A name has something to do with burning, I believe. If you drive on a bit and park, there's a path opposite the turning to Stony Bridge that'll lead you to it. But you'll find nothing of interest for you. I don't suppose I will, except the view. Uh, mostly trains. <laughs> Not so many of those these days. You'll recognise the spot because of the entrance to the tunnel. That isn't far away. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you'll not find anything much of interest there, I promise you. Right. Slate and rubble and no view to speak of. Oh, it's hot. Grattan. How you must have changed. I think I'll just sit a while. Wonder if I'm... if I brought a flask... Just once more. One last look for Magnus. Sir Otto. Sir Otto, over here. What news of Sir Henry de Champenard? He is sinking fast. There is little hope for him. My Lady Joanna is with him. Sir Henry does not suffer. We have seen to that. Or, to speak more plainly, Brother Jean has done so, for he has been at the bedside night and day. And the cause? Nothing but the general weakness of which you know, and a sudden chill with that late frost we had. Through here, my lord. Otto. You are too late, I'm afraid. Sir Henry is dead. I'm very sorry, Joanna, that I could not be by your husband's side when he died. My ship was delayed. Have no fear. Brother Jean did all he could for him. My husband would be attended by no one else. But you have not greeted our other visitor. Lady Isolde. I did not see you in the shadows. It is good to see you again, Otto. Even on so sad an occasion. I shall leave you to comfort one another. I have one or two things to organize. Roger, follow me. Sir John Carmino has not yet come, my lady. Nor likely to. I left the matter to his discretion. If he is premature in condolence, it might be thought overzealous on his part. The sooner this business is over, the better for all of us. <sighs> It is only left for me to don the black veil of sorrow. Should I wear it covering my face, do you think, Roger? Unless you can weep at will. <laughs> I have not wept since my wedding day. You'd better return to Otto and Isolde. I must see Brother Jean about one or two matters. How is my sister? Calm, Sir Otto. I expected it. You are aware that Sir Henry's son, William, being a minor, will forfeit his lands to the king until he attains his majority? I am, Sir Otto. As William's uncle by marriage, and therefore his legal guardian, I should be empowered to administer his estates with the king as overlord. But the circumstances are not ordinary, owing to the part I took in the so-called rebellion against his majesty. Therefore, the escheator, acting for the minor and the king, 
is likely to be one held in greater esteem than myself. His cousin, Sir John Carmineau, in all probability. In that event, I don't doubt that he will arrange matters smoothly for my sister, and she can perhaps afford to face the death of her husband with equanimity. I'm sure you must be right, my lord, but I'm afraid I don't understand such matters. Maybe not. I think I'd best go and pay tribute to Sir Henry. Lady Carmineau does not wish to pay tribute with the rest? It is not my practice to make a mockery of death. Sir Henry would be grateful for your prayers. He has had them, with regularity for many years, and with increasing fervor these past few weeks. I can assure you that everything possible was done for him. I'm sure. I am no stranger to the seeds of the black poppy, and the white, water hemlock, mandragora, and the sleep they can induce. Yes. The monk, Jean de Meral, was trained in the parent house at Angers, and he is especially skilled. Sir Henry himself had implicit faith in him. I do not doubt Sir Henry's faith, the monk's skill, or his zeal in employing that skill. But a healing plant can turn malignant if the dose is increased. I advise you to speak of this matter to my lady, not to me. It is none of my business. I will only say this. If anything evil has been done this day or yesterday, you will be held responsible with others when the time comes, not in this world where we lack proofs, but in the next, before God. Isolde, be careful what you say. Oh, God! How did I get... The car. I must get to the car. <laughs> Thank God. The car. It's torn. You've been in an accident or what? No, no. I, I, I'm fine. I, I'll just drive home. I do apologize. Thanks very much. Well, that's all in a day's work. I'm a doctor. A, a doctor? Oh. Well, the fact is, I must have walked up the hill a bit too fast. I, I, I felt giddy when I reached the top, and, and I, I was sick. I couldn't stop myself. Well, I suppose a lay-by is as good a place as any to throw up in. <laughs> And I expect a swallow of, uh, what is it, brandy? Mm? The flask you're clutching probably did you a power of good. Oh, uh, yes. You got far to go? A couple of miles or so. Well, wouldn't it be far more sensible if you left your car here and let me drive you home? Oh, no, no, I assure you, it was just one of those passing things. Pretty violent while it lasted. Look, um, you're not a patient of mine. I'm not trying to prescribe... I'm only warning you that it might be dangerous to drive. Well, uh, I... I only have to go to the top of Paul Hill. Oh, it's all on the way home. I live in for you. Mrs. Collins? <coughs> Mrs. Collins? Hello, darling. Surprised to see me? Good God. Peter. You look terrible. Your, your jacket's in ruins. For heaven's sake, you might have warned me. When we spoke, you, you said you wouldn't be flying back yesterday. How, how long have you been here? A half an hour. Big, big high. Hello. Hey, we ran and rang and nobody answered. <coughs> then a lady came up on a bike, Mrs. Collins, I think, and let us in. Hey, Mom's mad at you. Go and finish unpacking, Teddy. Oh, but Mom, I want to talk to Dick. <coughs> hey, she, you look Awful, Dick. Go and unpack. You can talk to him later. <coughs> oh, all right. Well. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, after you've changed, I suggest you join me in the dining room. I'll get Mrs. Collins to make coffee. Hi, 
I think Mrs. Collins is pretty efficient. And she's told me all about you. How you lock yourself away for hours among the professor's things. So, I can relax. Well, what do you mean, relax? I was imagining something young and stylish was around when you tried to put me off. I don't trust your professor an inch, but I'm satisfied on that account. Yeah, I see. I drove straight from the airport. Bill and Diana were rather startled because they guessed I'd spend the day with them. But I told them I was worried about you. Joe sends his regards and says the sooner you let him have your decision, the better. <laughs> well, I'm sure you can see that. He's thinking of amalgamating with his other firm. You remember I told you. But if they do amalgamate, it wouldn't be before the fall anyway, and it wouldn't affect your job. No, no. You haven't been listening to a word I said. Yes, I have. What have I been talking about, then? You were saying something about Joe's firm, a merger of some sort. What on earth is the matter with you? Have you no interest in our future? You, I might be talking to someone in another world. Darling, let's not start on the wrong foot. If we start arguing, we'll wear ourselves out and spoil things for Teddy. If I'm vague and inattentive, you must blame it on exhaustion. I took a walk this morning in the hope of pulling myself together. It seems to have slowed me up. What do you mean? exhausted. How can you be exhausted? You're not doing anything. Oh, forget it, forget it, forget it. Look, Magnus, I'm phoning from the bedroom. I have to keep my voice down. Vita's arrived. I thought she wasn't due until next Monday. Today's Wednesday. Well, she's come earlier, worried about me or something. Well, did you manage to make another trip before she arrived? How do you feel? Jaded. I came to to find myself practically on the railway line near the tunnel with a train rushing past. It was a place called Grattan. Yes, I warned you about that kind of danger, didn't I? Yes. It's always present. No warning system with a brain under the drug. But even more worrying, I I'm getting confused. I find it hard to tell where reality starts and ends. The figures are so vivid. Otto the Dragon and Esolda. She is beautiful, Magnus. Compared to the other woman, her dress is plain. No wimple, just a jeweled fillet, crowning golden hair. And her voice... Confusion? Now that's fascinating. Do you know what? I have a good mind to join you, so that we can go on our next trip together. I'd like to take a look at this Isolde Carmino. <laughs> she sounds worth seeing. She's Bedruggan's girl, not ours. Listen, Magnus, on this trip, Sir Henry had died. Must have been a gap of months since my last visit. Roger seems involved in it, some kind of foul play. Foul play? Now listen to this. Found by my researcher friend. You remember I mentioned him? Yes. It's an order about the body of Sir Henry de Champenard from the bishop. He forbids exhumation of the body. He says that no one should afford any help, counsel, or favor for such an exhumation or removal. <sighs> I wish I understood all the underlying jealousies and rivalries. It's like half reading a story and not being allowed to read to the end. It's strange, but that other world seems more vivid to me somehow than my own. I huh? know. By the way, uh, how's the monkey? Uh, dead. Dead? I killed him on purpose. I have work to do on his brain cells and the effects of the drug. Oh, it's all quite scientific. There's no need to get upset. <laughs> I'm upset because of the risk you seem prepared to take with my brain cells. But your brain's different, my dear boy. You can take a lot more punishment yet. Richard! It's Vita. Richard! I'll call you again when I can. Will you take another trip, Richard? This weekend? I'll try, I'll try. I must go now. Oh, here you are. What are you hiding here for? I was just phoning Magnus. Oh, for heaven's sakes, can he leave you alone for two minutes? Look what I found! Look what I found! Hi, Dick! What's this horrible thing? Christ, what the hell have you been up to? I wasn't doing anything. There are some rooms in the basement, and the key was in the loft. You, you've been... been there's a dark little room full of bottles, Mom, and there's something like a dead kitten in one of them, and this monkey's head or whatever it is. Did you, did, did you break anything or touch anything else? No. If I catch you anywhere near that room again, I'll murder you. Dick! If you'd come next week as you were supposed to, Vita, this would never have happened. Why, you're shaking. Anyone would think there were explosives in there. Just keep away from there in future. I just don't know what to make of it, Diana. I've never heard him speak to Teddy like he did yesterday. The poor boy's very upset. 
And Richard doesn't look at all well. Very, you know, hollow-eyed. Mm. He says he's been sleeping badly. Well, honey, it's a good thing you joined him there. A husband on the loose is a husband on the prowl, as I told you before. I've had experience with Bill. Oh, Bill. Well, we all know Bill can't be trusted out of your sight. Mm. <laughs> well, let's just hope that darn professor hasn't been putting Dick up to something. I don't trust that man. Never have and never will. Mm, I can guess why that is. Oh, don't be ridiculous. He may be like that, but Dick certainly isn't. Very much the reverse. Maybe that's the attraction for the professor. Oh, I gotta go, Diana. That Dick and Teddy. Uh, uh, Dick took him out for a walk to make up for the scene yesterday, you know. Uh, bye. bye. I'll ring you later. Mom's going at the show to my collection. You do that. Hello. Well, that's eased the atmosphere anyway. It was the least you could do after the way you talked to him yesterday. Is this letter for me? Yeah. You know, you know, darling, I'm going to love it here. And it's so wonderful to be together. Well, aren't you going to tell me what's in that letter you find so engrossing? Oh, nothing. Just a piece of research I was interested in. Research? What about? Let me see. Sir John Carmino? Mm-hmm. Well, I can't make sense of this. What does it say? That Sir John acted as a cheater for the estates of Sir Henry of Champenon, and that Lady Joanna will be free to marry whomsoever she likes, and that Sir Otto Budragon has lost. Lost? <laughs> well, don't look so depressed by it. When did all this happen, for God's sake? In the reign of Edward the Third, thirteen twelve to thirteen seventy seven. Well, why on earth did you care what happened then? Oh, Richard. Teddy, honey, don't put so much marmalade on your toast, okay? Oh, morning, darling. Morning. Uh, no, just coffee, please. Uh, Teddy, you've had enough now. Run and get ready. For what, Mom? Church, dear. What else on a Sunday morning? Okay. <laughs> and if you're going to drive a stick, you'd better make a move, too. What will you do while we're in church? Drive a little. Perhaps leave the car and walk. I'll be back to pick you up. Don't worry. Have fun. Okay. Bye. 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 You know what comes about when women scold? Their tongues turn black and curl into their throats. I must pluck it back. Open your mouths. Ah, let's pray God it does the trick. Now, you must behave. I have work to do. We have guests. Let me stay another night and not sleep aboard. I may find myself hard aground if I make sail. What's this? The longer you remain, the more dangerous for us both. You know how gossip travels. Come here anyway was madness with the vessel well known. There's nothing to that. I come frequently to the bay and to this river. It was pure chance that brought you here as well. It was not, and you know it very well. The steward brought you my letter telling you I should be here. Roger is a trusty messenger. With my sister Joanna away at Trelawne, this seemed a safe chance meeting place. A risk worth taking. Mm. Worth taking, yes. But I do not trust the steward as you do, and you know my reasons keeps our meeting secret for the time because it pleases him. One word to my husband and we'd be lost. Oliver is in London. Malice travels with every wind that blows. Oliver cares not a jot if I live or die. He has women wherever he goes. But his pride would never brook a faithless wife. That I know. My lady, uh, Alice has the children's ponies. They are saddled and bridled. Will you come? Yes, I am coming. Goodbye, Otto. Not for long. 
I am coming, Roger. <laughs> Look where you're going. Wandering across the road like that, you'll get yourself killed, man. Are you all right? I'm sorry. Y yes, y yes, I'm fine. Oh, no, it's half past one. Vita. I'm sorry, darling. I can't keep saying that, but the car broke down. I'm most frightfully sorry. I wouldn't have had this happen for the world. I can believe it. I'm sorry. I seem to have spoilt your weekend for you. What? What, what? what do you mean? This telegram came for you while you were out. From your professor, naturally. Wired from Cambridge. It reads, Have a good trip this weekend. Hope your girl turns up. He says, what? Shall be thinking of you. Greetings, Magnus. Now listen, Vita, that telegram is a complete joke. A leg pull on the part of Magnus. Don't make an absolute idiot of yourself by taking it seriously. Look, I've been honest with you. I've been helping him with one or two bits of research, and this telegram is just his way of wishing me luck. You're not a scientist. What sort of research can you possibly do? And that telegram hardly reads like a serious scientific document. Look, Vita, it was a complete joke. I'm not interested in the professor or his jokes. You share so many of them and keep me out that I'm past care. Oh, for God's sake, you're behaving like every well-worn joke about wives I've ever heard. The simplest thing to do would be to ring up Magnus first thing in the morning and tell him you're filing a divorce suit because you suspect me of waiting to meet up with some scrubber at Land's End. He'll howl his head off. All right. What were you really doing this morning while we were in church? I've told you, mooching about in a derelict quarry. It has connections with an old manor house, and Magnus and I happen to be interested in the site. Then I couldn't start the car, which I'd parked rather awkwardly in a ditch. It's news to me that your professor is an historian as well as a scientist. Good news, don't you think? Makes a change from all those embryos and bottles. I encourage it. You encourage him in everything. That's why he makes use of you. Oh, God. While you were scrabbling about in that quarry for your precious professor, I've been busy too. Bill and Diana phoned. They're just crazy to see the house, so I suggested they put off their visit to Dublin for 48 hours and motor down to see us for lunch and so stay the night. You what? They jumped at the idea. Oh, my God, Vita. I'm glad you're pleased. No, no, you're right, Vita. American policy is changing there. Eh? Bill rather hoped to get the embassy, but they gave it to Peters. Remember him, Vita? Oh, do I? Surely he doesn't even know that country exists. <laughs> Uh, no, 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 a diplomat's job is not an easy one. Of course, there's nothing like moving to a new country for giving you uh, new interests in life. Well, y you'll know what I mean, Richard. Aren't you going into partnership with Joe? Mm. That's wonderful. It's not settled. There's still a lot to be discussed. Well, naturally. I mean, you can't decide on a flick of a coin, but what an opportunity. His firm is on the crest of a wave right now, and you'd never regret it. Especially as I gather you've nothing really to lose this side. Uh, no, uh, no special ties. Of course, Vita would make a home anywhere. She has the knack. And with an apartment in New York and a weekend place in the country, you, you'd lead a very full life together with plenty of opportunities for travel thrown in. Mm. Come and look at the view, Diana. It looks great by moonlight. What? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Won't be long, boys. <laughs> Behave now. Uh, hey, look, don't, don't think I'm butting in, but uh, you know how girls talk. You, you've got Vita worried. She told Diana you'd blown cool over the idea of coming to the States, and she can't figure out why. Women always think the worst. You know, um, I, I met this girl in Madrid. Uh, Diana was in the Bahamas at the time with her parents, and I was just crazy about her. Nineteen, she wasn't a real peach. Of course, we both knew it couldn't last. She had a job at the embassy there, and Diana was due back in London when her vacation was over. I was so wild about the kid, I, I felt like cutting my throat when we said goodbye. However, I survived, and so did she, and I haven't seen her since. If you think I've got a girl around the corner, you couldn't be more wrong. Oh, well, that's fine, just fine. I, I wouldn't blame you if you had, uh, as long as you kept it quiet from Vita. Right. Now then, anyone for more drinks? Have a nice chat, boys? Ah, uh, fine, just fine. Hey, look here, uh, let me help you with those drinks, Vita. Hmm, it's a beautiful place, isn't it? Yes. Your professor is very lucky. Mm. Talk to me, Dick. I want to know all about your brilliant friend. What's he like as a man? How did you meet him? Hey, 
Teddy told me there was a room locked up in the basement here full of monkeys' heads. Mm, how deliciously creepy. Well, Tell me, Dick. There's a quarter of bourbon left in the bottle, and it's all yours. I'm for bed. Dick? Would you excuse me, please? I see what you mean, Vida. He looks ghastly. Where's the measure? Oh, to hell with the measure. But to move him in such a gale, Roger, if it should be the smallpox. Sir Otto has been informed of his son's illness. If I may suggest, the guest chamber at the Priory is vacant. Neither I nor my brethren fear smallpox. I would make it my business to watch him day or night. We should have decided on this sooner. Come, we have delayed long enough. Watch your skill on this occasion. If you should let him die, you would have to answer to his father. And in that event, the prior himself could not protect you, Brother Jean. From what I understand, Sir Otto Bodrogan will have trouble enough protecting himself. You know, Sir Oliver Carmino lay at Buckinard last night and left at dawn, telling none of his servants his destination. If he has hidden in secret along the coast, it would be for one thing only. To seek out his lady's lover and destroy him. I would not give much for Sir Otto's chances if he were caught in an ambush. We are ready, Roger. Go ahead of me, Brother Jean. I will not be long. As you wish. Boy. Boy. Sir? Ride like the devil to the guest. Warn Lady Isolde to stay indoors. The dragon was to have sailed here to the creek tonight, but he'll not venture in this gale. For God's sake, ride like the devil. I will. Roger! Coming, my lady. That's my brother's ship in the bay, Roger. Yes, my lady. And there's Sir Otto. I must warn him. Sir Otto! Who are those men? Oh, stop the chariot! <sighs> it's an ambush. Oh, can he not see? Roger, Roger, come back. I will not become involved. Sir Otto, for God's sake, run! Sir Otto, behind you! Take care! Run, for God's sake, Sir Otto. My lady! No, my lady! Isolde. Let me go, Roger! Uh, Otto! My love! Oh, no! No! Otto! It's a pity we have to leave today, Vita. Frankly, I'm worried about Dick. Hey, what time did uh, you say he set off on his walk of his? Oh, well, I, I, I'm i not sure. I, I must have still been asleep. Have some more coffee, Vita. Come on, I'll help you make it. Quiet morning for you, Bill. Helps get rid of all that bourbon. <laughs> Hi, Dick. Hi, Dick, over here. Oh, you're a sly one, slinking off into the early hours for this, uh, this walk. Hey, see, you look a bit off. You all right? As a matter of fact, I've just witnessed a most appalling crime. What on earth? I you... felt I needed some air, so I took the car down to a place I know near the estuary, and the boat went aground. It was blowing damn hard, and the chap aboard and his crew had to take the dinghy. They made the opposite shore all right, and this appalling thing then happened. These thugs, these bloody thugs on the opposite shore. The chap and the boat didn't have a chance. Oh, my God. God, how terrible. Hey, hadn't you better call the police? Police? It's not a job for the police. It's this chap's son I'm thinking of. He's ill and someone will have to tell him. But good God, Dick, it's your duty to inform the police. This is murder. And, and, and you say you know the chap who was drowned and his son. What? Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I, I've heard people talk of the family. I... 
pull yourself together, man. You're obviously in a state of shock. I think I'd better slip up to the bedroom, pull myself together. Oh, I need some sleep. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, don't, don't worry about us. Vita's taking care of us just fine. And I was mortified. Staying upstairs all morning... Not even coming down to say goodbye to Bill and Diana. What on earth is the matter with you these days? I don't understand. I'm very sorry, Vita. Bourbon allergy combined with shellfish. Hmm. By the way, Bill said to tell you that he'll be listening to the radio and reading the papers in Ireland to see what's happening here in Cornwall. Make sense to you? Well, he means the weather, I suppose. Hello? B.D. Young speaking. Oh, hello, Magnus. It's his house, after all. He'll have more fun entertaining your friend than you had putting up with mine. Vita says, of course. Well, I'll let you know about the train later. Um... Have you been on a trip recently? Uh, yes. I went to Gretton again. With ill effect? As a matter of fact, I'm feeling pretty lousy. Something I ate or drank disagreed with me. I've been violently sick, and I've got a peculiar bloodshot eye. What about the confusion? That too. I had a nightmare. Someone called Otto was set on by thugs. Ah. Well, I'll get my man at the British Museum to check on that. Did, um... Did Roger have a hand in it? No, he didn't. Ah, strangely, I'm rather glad about that. Now, listen, no more trips unless we're together, no matter how big the temptation. Swear it. I'll try. Goodbye, Magnus. Cheer up, darling. Only three more days and he'll be here. Won't that be wonderful? Oh, that was great, Dick. Hey, Mom, can Mrs. Collins cook them for our lunch tomorrow? I'm sure she can. Go and put them in the fridge, honey. Otherwise, the house will stink with the smell of fish. <sighs> it's hot. Thank God this room's cool. Yes. Teddy's really taken to sailing. I wonder if we... Oh, there's a note for Mrs. Collins, darling. Telegram came over the phone to say Professor Lane is catching the 2.30 train from London instead of the 4.30. 2.30. Arriving St. Austell, 7.30. Well, thank the Lord for Teddy's mackerel. He'll be here for dinner. To hell with a mackerel. Poor Magnus has been kicking his heels down at St. Austell for the last 20...
20 minutes. I'll take your car. It's faster. Well, the 7.30 was dead on time, sir. Yes, I dare say, but that's not the point. The point is I was meeting someone who was on it, and he isn't here. Well, sir, he probably got tired of waiting and took a taxi. No, if he'd done that, he would have telephoned or left a message with the chap at your booking office. Uh, I'll tell you what, sir. Uh, I'll open the booking office up, see if there's a message. This way. Now, let me see, sir. Uh... No, I can't see it. Look, that case, the initials, M-A-L, that's his. But why oh. did he leave it here? Uh, there's a message, sir. Uh, that's from the booking office card. A suitcase with initials M-A-L to be delivered to a gentleman named Mr. Richard Young. You Mr. Young? Yes, I am. Uh, owner of suitcase said to say he changed his mind and decided to get out at par and oh. walk from there. What a bloody silly thing to do. Well, uh, it's a fine evening for a walk, sir. There's no accounting for taste. Well, I promised Teddy he could wait up for the professor. Thank heavens I sent him to bed. Midnight and still no sign. I do think it's extremely bad manners on his part. He must have known we'd have dinner ready for him. For heaven's sake, Richard, what are you reading? Whatever it is, it's obviously of more interest than anything I'm saying. In some papers I found in Magnus's case when I unpacked it for him. Not more historical documents. Oh, really, Dick, I think I prefer Magnus the scientist to Magnus the historian. He really is the weirdest man. I went into his room to take some towels and thought I'd hang up his dressing gown, which you'd just tossed onto the bed, and the funniest little bottle fell out. What? Well, it was empty, so I threw it away, but really, what on did earth this, was... Did, listen, did this bottle have a label on it? Label? Oh, well, I hardly looked for it. Oh, wait a minute, yes. Just said B. Very weird. Oh, my God. I'll get it. inspector to see you. It's about a uh, Professor Lane, sir. Yes. That's him, inspector. H how? Uh, word came through that one of our patrols had found the body of a man resembling Professor Lane near the railway line just the side of Trevelyan Tunnel, not far from Grattan. Grattan. Mm. He seems to have received a blow on the head from a passing train, unobserved by the driver and the guard. He managed, apparently, to crawl into a small disused hut just above the line, and then he collapsed. It looks as if he must have been dead for some hours. Oh, here's the doctor. Oh, well, he has to be here, sir. You see, there'll be a post-mortem and everything. Mr. Young, isn't it? Uh, yes. Yeah. We've met. I don't know if you remember. You yes, I do. You weren't feeling well, and I made sure you drove home safely. Yes, indeed, I remember. I'm Dr. Powell. If it's any consolation, he couldn't have lived long after receiving a blow like that. So he didn't just lie there wondering why nobody came? Oh, no, no. Um, this was his walking stick, sir found lying halfway down the embankment. Yes, it's, it's, it's one of many that he has. Mm. You realize, sir, that you'll be required to give evidence at the inquest. There might be a question of amnesia, or even, of course, suicide. I, I mean, how could a grown man walk into a train and not see it? Darling? Mm. Darling, some tea. Oh, thank you. How are you feeling now, darling? Oh, all right. It's all over now, darling. The postmortem and the inquest. Now you must just forget it. It it really was extraordinarily generous of the professor to leave you, Kilmarth. What do you tend to do with it? When we go to America. Oh, for God's sake, Vita, can't you just leave it alone for once? Well, somebody's got to decide something. You just lie there staring at Magnus' walking stick and that letter they found on him. I don't think I can stand much more, Dick. Something's going on, and I don't know what it is. I'm trying to understand. But, 
But no matter what the coroner said, I don't believe that the professor just walked into that train or that he slipped on the bank and fell because he was so involved with some historical survey he didn't see the train. You and I both knew, you Magnus. Heard. He was so he was so alert. You heard the inquest. There's no other possible explanation. Nothing was found in the post-mortem to give any suspicion. For God's sake, what's, what's behind this? Did you have some secret pact between you both that he would kill himself? Magnus died accidentally walking into a freight train as it was going into a tunnel. Now, for God's sake, accept that and leave me in peace. Yes, world. so that you can drool over that damn letter again. You keep your secret. Dear Dick, I'm writing this in the train. And it will probably be illegible. There's probably no need to write at all. And by the time you receive it, we shall have had an uproarious evening together. I write as a safety measure. My findings to date are pretty conclusive that we are onto something of prime importance regarding the brain. The particular cells I've been working on, which I will call the memory box, store not only our own memories, but habits of the earlier brain pattern we inherit. With the use of a drug, the inherited older pattern takes over and becomes dominant. Well, by the way, I enclose an account of Otto Bodruggen's death. Poor Isolde, who will comfort her now? Will we ever know? As to the drug itself, it's dangerous and could be lethal if taken to excess. So, dear boy, if anything happens to me, destroy what remains in the lab. No time to say any more. We are drawing into Exeter. A bientôt, in this world, or the other, or hereafter, Magnus. If anything happens to me, destroy what remains in the lab. Uh, Dick, uh, Dick, Mom said... Teddy, will you tell Peter that I have work to do and I do not wish to be disturbed? If anything happens to me, destroy. Mm. Only C left. It must be destroyed. Destroyed completely. Oh, but I haven't taken. Dismiss me. I told the Lady Joanna... I know, I know. And now she may threaten harm to you and this whole place. I would not have it thus. But think of your brother. Little Robbie must come to no harm. He has grown to love you, even as I do. Any further suffering that may come my way, I can bear alone. If I have brought dishonor on two houses, my husband's and Otto Bedragon's, which doubtless will be said about me down the years... I will not do the same to yours. I should leave. I should never have taken shelter here from my husband's anger. This was my father's farm and will be Robbie's when I die. And had you sheltered here for one night only and not 15, you would have lent grace enough to last through centuries. 15 nights. And on each one of them, since I've been with you, I have stood looking out across the sea to Chapel Point, remembering that his ship would anchor there. Part of me died with him, Roger, the day they killed him, and I think you know it. Yes, I've always known it. If I've given you cause to believe otherwise, forgive me. Roger, up to the Joanna! Have no fear. My lady. In all the ten years you served my household, you never thought to bid me welcome here. Hmm. So this is the retreat. And snug enough, no doubt, on a winter's night, apart from the smell of beasts. How do you do, Isolde? I had heard you had fled here. I do very well, as you see. I have lived better here and had more kindness in two weeks than in many months or years before. I don't doubt it. Tell me, do both brothers share you here before the heart? Why, oh, you... Roger. Roger. 
Not as yet. The elder is too proud. The younger too shy. My protestations of affection fall upon deaf ears. What do you want of me, Joanna? I bring you a message from your brother. He has heard of the flight from your husband's house and the disgrace that this has brought to our family and yours. He offers you the chance to retire to the nunnery of Cornworthy in Devon. I am told the air is mild at Cornworthy. The nuns there live to a great age. Uh, there is a second course. To remain here as drab to my one-time steward. Uh, but I warn you, the parish might serve you as they recently served a tenant of mine and have you riding to do penance on the back of a black ram. <laughs> what do you say? We could mount one of you on a ram and the other on a ewe and have them jog trot together. <laughs> you bitch! You bitch! I'll kill you! Leave her alone! Oh, 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 stop it, Richard! Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Oh, oh my, my God! Vita, Vita, darling! Oh, oh, my God! Come on, Vita! Phone. I must phone. Look, I want Dr. Powell. Quickly, it's urgent. One moment, please. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Hello, Powell. Yeah? It's Richard Young from Comarth. You remember, the friend of Professor Lane. Uh, yes. Look, the most frightful thing has happened. I, I, I had a sort of mental blackout, and I, I tried to strangle my wife. And I may have hurt her, I don't know. I, I don't think so. She went upstairs with the boy. I think they may have locked themselves in the bedroom. I'm speaking to you from the lobby downstairs. All right. I'll come along straight away. Well, everything's under control. Your wife's all right and your stepson. And now what about you? Have I hurt her? Slight bruising on the neck, nothing more. She insists you were fighting drunk and didn't know what you were doing, but it was a pretty grim experience. She says you uh, don't usually drink. I wasn't drunk. What are you on? Something Professor Lane gave you? Yes. Was he on the same drug when he walked into that train? Yes, he was. But the frightening thing was, I haven't taken any this time. 
It just happened. Yeah. I ought to get you to hospital for observation. Oh, no, please, no. On one condition. That you let me attend you and give me whatever's left of the drug so that I can have it analyzed. Downstairs in the lab. In a bottom marked C. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to sedate you. When you come round, we'll discuss whether or not you should go to hospital. Now, this won't hurt you. Don't tell Vita. She does not... She disliked Magnus. And if she knew this, she'd dislike him e even more. So don't tell her, will you? D don't tell Vita... Where, where am I? Well, Dr. Powell, uh, how long have I... Been? Five days. Five days? Mm -hmm. D did I tell you... Everything. Yes. Isolde, Roger, Otto, everything. You're lucky to be alive, you know. I've had the remnants of that drug analyzed. That bottle contained the most potent hallucinogen that's ever been discovered. And other substances as well, which we aren't even sure of yet. Are you trying to tell me that everything I've seen has been a uh, hallucination? Uh, no. No, I think Professor Lane was onto something that might have proved extraordinarily significant about the working of the brain. And he chose you as a guinea pig because he knew you would do whatever he told you. And that you were highly suggestible into the bargain. Have you... Uh, have you told... Vita? That you were on the verge of a nervous breakdown and suffering from strain and delayed shock owing to the sudden death of Professor Lane. That's all. Whatever you say, I did see that other world. The other world? I suppose we all carry one inside us. You can say what you like, but they all lived. I read about them. And the fact remains, I've been in that other world. I've seen it and known it. It was cruel, hard, and very often bloody, and so were the people in it. Except for Isolde, and latterly Roger. But my God, it held a fascination for me which is lacking in my own world of today. Yes, a way of escape, a flight from reality. You didn't want to live either in London or New York. The 14th century made an exciting if somewhat gruesome antidote to both. All right. What have I to do? Get right away from here, from the pool of Roger Kilmerth. Your wife suggested Ireland. You have friends there, I believe. Supposing I said no? Well, I'd sent for an ambulance and got you off to hospital. I thought Ireland was a better idea. It's up to you. I hope we aren't going to find ourselves beside that crowd in the plane. Mom! Mom! Oh, oh, not so loud, Teddy. Oh, oh look what you've Teddy, done. Teddy, why don't you sit down and keep quiet for us? Here you are, Dick. I'll pick it up for you. Thank you. It's a, it's a nice stick, isn't it? Yes. Oh, those must be the initials of Magnus' father around the top. Oh! Oh, oh, Dick, the top's loose. D did you Would know Would you give it, it to me? It's meant to be loose. Oh. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean It's to. all right, darling. Look, uh, I must rush off to the gents. If they call the flight, go ahead and get in the seats in front. If I'm caught in the mob, I'll find myself a seat in the back, and we can change places after takeoff. As long as you two are together. Now, here, take the boarding cards. No, I'll, I'll hang on to mine, just in case. Oh, Dick, honestly, you might have gone before. I'm You're sorry. worse than Teddy. I'm sorry, but nature calls. Excuse me. Excuse me. Could you tell me where I can catch a taxi from here, please? I thought you'd be here. As I passed Kilmarth, I spotted the front door open. Did Vita phone you? No, I rang the airport to see if you'd boarded. They said no. Then I knew where you'd be. Here at Kilmarth, where it all began. You sound as though you expected me to do this. I knew there was a risk. 
But I wanted to give you a chance just to see if you could make it, instead of going by the rules. Which say? Put your addict inside once he's well and truly hooked. Have you taken some more of the drug? Yes. I thought you'd given me all that was left in bottle C. I did. Only Magnus had some with him. He kept it here, in the head of his cane. It's hollow, you see? And that was the rest of bottle B. I think I should tell you that we've discovered that the drug contains a substance of some toxicity that could seriously affect the central nervous system, possibly leading to paralysis. I um, have the full report here, Mr. Young. Mr. Young. Take some water. There's no remedy for this plague, Robbie. The swelling has spread to my throat and blocked the windpipe. A voice in my lips. That's comfort enough. Oh. Hear my confession, Robbie. There's no priest left to shrive. If it concerns the lady Isolde, God rest her soul in peace. I don't need to hear it, Roger. I knew you loved her, and love her memory still. So do I. There was no sin in that for either of us. No sin in loving. But murder, yes. When Miss Alder became so ill, she was in such agony. But it did not last for long. It could have made her suffer for weeks, months. Yes, I couldn't bear that thought. I gave her something to ease the pain. It was murder, Robbie. An immortal sin. And no one knows of it but you. Uh, hear my confession, Robbie. Absolve me. Uh, oh. Christian soul out of this world. In the name of the Father Almighty who created thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. It's finished. Roger's dead. He's free. <laughs> it's all over. Don't stand up. You're too weak. <laughs> Sit here. Doctor, would you look up for me in the encyclopedia? Look, it's there beside you. Mm -hmm. The date of the Black Death. Uh, uh, 1348. Endemic in the Far East. They've had a number of cases in Vietnam. Have they? Well, I've just seen what it did. And type of 600 years ago. So, there's no more temptation. Roger is free, and so am I. Now, before I put that call through to Vita in Ireland, suppose you repeat what you were telling me about the drug. I'm afraid I didn't hear what you said. Well, there's no point now. I burnt the report with the flame from my lighter when you were on your knees reciting that prayer for the dying. That's no answer. It's all you're going to get. Well, that'll be Vita. Now for the countdown. And shall I tell her I got locked in the gents and I'll join her tomorrow? It would be wiser if you told her you hope to join her later, perhaps in a few weeks' time, if you're lucky. But that's absurd. There's nothing to hold me back. I've told you, it's all over. I'm free. Answer the phone. My, my hand. I can't seem to. Oh, I. I can't. Do...
in The House on the Strand, the novel by Daphne du Maurier, adapted for radio by Philip Lever and Kay Patrick, Richard Young was played by Ian Richardson, Magnus Lane by Richard Herndl, Vita Young by Bonnie Huron, and Roger by David March. Mrs. Collins, Elizabeth Morgan, the vicar, Brian Haynes, Caravan owner, David Sinclair, Dr. Powell, Frank Duncan, Teddy, Judy Bennett, Bill, Vernon Joyner, and Diana, Julie Hallam. Father Pryor, Manning Wilson, Brother Jean, Anthony Hall, the Lady Joanna, Elizabeth Morgan, Sir Otto, Vernon Joyner, the Lady Isolde, Rosalind Shanks, and Robbie, David Timpson. Radiophonic sounds were by David Kane of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop, and the play was produced by Betty Davis. <laughs>